Hello everyone and welcome to Life Meets Jason. This is a long form essay about a rather serious topic, so I'm gonna put out this shout out to please subscribe to my channel right now so I don't have to interrupt it later. I'm really passionate about the diversity that this channel provides and doing my part to bring you interviews, essays, community spotlights, and news stories. One simple click means so much because the YouTube algorithm looks at the channel's subscriptions and comments and likes. So please share this with friends if you find entertaining or thought provoking or is an issue that's important to you. I'm sure that most of you have heard by now the national story about hate symbology worn by two men here in my city of Santee, California. It quickly became national news and it's further put a stain on a city that was already steeped in racism. So I'll start at the beginning and fill in the blanks as best as I can. During my research, I came to believe that focusing on one or two individuals was missing the bigger problems surrounding how people view race and politics, especially here. I hope you find it interesting as I do, even though it is a difficult subject. In 1779, a priest named Father Junipero Serra came to what would eventually be San Diego. He used the local Indian tribe to build a dam and that brought water to Mission Valley so we could live here. He also built a church and today it is the oldest still operational Catholic church on the West Coast. A hundred years later, a guy named George Cowles bought 400 acres and started a vineyard. The area was called Cowles Town. And in fact, even today, there is a mountain called Cow's Mountain, which is great for hiking. I've been there a whole bunch. And it is the highest point in San Diego. And on a clear day, you can see all the way to North County, Mexico, and the ocean. In 1885, Hosmer McCoon, that's a cool name, purchased 9,500 acres and named it Finita Ranch after his wife, Fanny which was really nice to do. That's a great anniversary present. In 1893, we got a new name, Santee, and shortly afterward, we got the Scripps family of newspaper fame, who moved in, bought 96 acres, and used Finita Ranch as a vacation resort, because when you are rich and famous, you get to do that. In the 1930s, the federal government used it as a place to train their troops during World War II. World, World War II. And 20 years later, the Carlton Company moved in and bought a whole bunch of stuff. And the president was named uh, Bill Mast. And that's where we get Mast Boulevard from. The population exploded over the next 20 years. And through a series of hoops, jumps, and various votes that went different ways, we eventually became incorporated in 1980 into San Diego. <laughs> According to Wikipedia, reporting on the 2010 census, Santee had 19,000 homes, the median income was $79,000, and it had one of the lowest crime rates in San Diego. Good. It was described as having growing businesses and upscale housing. We have rock climbing, fishing, trails, lovely parks, and 1,100 acres of Riverside property. According to a 2000 article by the San Diego Union Tribune, it was on Christmas Day in 1922 that the Ku Klux Klan made themselves known by throwing a huge dinner for a hundred people. They also called themselves the Exalted Cyclops of San Diego Number 64, because marketing is everything. A 2000 article from the Journal of San Diego stated that this group wore hoods, beat and tortured people, burned homes and barns and generally terrorized everybody that they saw as inferior. This especially applied to Mexican immigrants, many who were crossing the border for jobs, and they were kidnapped and beat, and then many were never seen again. The San Diego Union Tribune has an interesting quote. Whites from the Midwest found in the Klan a solution to the anxieties they felt when they encountered this new environment and new peoples. The article I read goes on to talk politics and how it used to be acceptable to belong to hate groups and how many people were elected to big positions and government up through the 70s, 80s, and arguably even to this day. And that includes the military, which up until 1986 allowed soldiers, soldiers, to be members of hate groups even though there was a very long history of violence, murder, and general hate against Jewish and minority people, many of whom were their serving brothers and sisters. 
Official KKK chapters were formed with thousands of soldiers who proudly stood there and had their picture taken in uniform, and there were whole chapters on board Navy ships and meetings held at Camp Pendleton. It is insane to me how long this was allowed. In 1986, I was eight years old by then, and this is within my lifetime, not like my grandparents' lifetime, my lifetime. And if you say I'm old, I will kick your ass. Southern California was and is a melting pot of many different cultures and traditions, and a lot of people didn't, and don't, like that. The sheer scope of hate-based violence in San Diego is absolutely stupefying, and if I sat here and included all the figures in San Diego area, I'd be here all day long, which I don't want to be. Not that those crimes count against Santee. I mean, they're so far away. They're like 15 minutes away. According to an article in South Coast Today in 1999, Lance Corporal Carlos Colbert was attacked and paralyzed by five young white men who were shouting racial slurs at him at a house party. He said that he'd gone outside to help a fellow Marine in trying to deal with a potentially violent skinhead who apparently had punched a woman. 16, according to a story in The Voice of San Diego, Shelley Monroe, who was part of the 2% black population here, was fighting the school district over the treatment of her four children from the Cajun Park Elementary School. Elementary school, these are children and her children were subjected to racial slurs, vandalism of their property, including Shelley's car, and people throwing things at them. Even a teacher got in on the action. During Black History Month, one of the teachers singled out her daughter and said, hey, you're black. All these other children are white. You should be really happy that you're here. Yeah, how lucky that she got to go to that school. Once Shelley's complaints were taken seriously after she talked to administrators at every level, suggesting diversity training and other steps to improve the situation at a systemic level, allegedly the district kept saying, sure, of course, you know, we're on it, but they didn't really take any action. So she asked if her children could at least be bused to a different school. She'd already pulled them out and was homeschooling them. She drove to the school every day, picked up their assignments, and they were never graded. No attention was paid to them, so they were really learning. The school district said they didn't have any money to take her children to a different school. But as soon as the story got out, they offered her a no-fault NDA agreement, giving her about 650 bucks a month for gas mileage. Also, she had to withdraw her complaints and not say anything about this. She was quoted as saying, this doesn't feel like justice. Can anybody... <laughs> In 2017, according to myself, my husband and I were looking for a house. We had been living in a condo and we wanted a backyard. He wanted to garden. I wanted a place for my dogs to run around. And we decided to check out Santee. Now we knew the reputation that this place had been called in the past, Clan T. So I was really concerned for my safety because I'm kind of flamboyant and I stick out like a sore thumb. Every time we went to an open house, on top of just seeing that house, we would or I would, go knocking on some doors and say, hey, what's diversity like here? Are you gonna kill me? All right, I, I didn't say that second part, but essentially that's what I was asking. For the most part, people were really friendly and even kind of laughed at that and were like, no, everything's great. This is a nice part of town, don't worry about it. One day after driving around to a bunch of open houses, we decided to stop by Wood Glen Park to give us and the dogs a chance to get out and stretch our legs. And there was a dog park there. There was also a little skate area and a whole bunch of kids running around. And Rose said, oh, wow, this is a really nice family area. And, you know, kind of talked about if we had a kid. And I said, that's, that's cool. But just then this 10, 11 year old boy uh, with a skateboard came running by us saying, hey, faggot. At first I thought he was saying it to me, and my heart sped up like 500%. And I was absolutely shocked, but it turns out he was just, you know, yelling at one of his friends. You know, in a friendly way, like a friendly faggot way. The last time I was called that, my jaw was dislocated outside of a gay bar by this guy while all of his friends cheered him on. So to me, I mean, once you've been through something like that, you never ever forget it. 
and I've always just been waiting for the other shoe to drop. You know, that kid got that from somewhere. He didn't just pull it out of a vacuum. His family, mom, friends, school, whatever, he thinks that it's acceptable to just yell that out because apparently no one's told him any different. And ever since, I've had this tinge of fear in the back of my mind, because what are the odds that somebody like me can live in Clan T and not eventually face some sort of violence? And in 2020, just last week, hatred raised its ugly head again. According to an article by Hector Peralta of the San Diego Union Tribune, a man wearing a white cone KKK hood walked into a Vons grocery store. He was photographed by other shoppers and the pictures went viral on the internet, as you can imagine. Store employees asked him to remove his hood and he didn't want to, but he did remove it when he got to the checkout line. Five days later, a man and his wife walked into a food for less wearing face masks with a Nazi swastika attached to it. His wife was also wearing a Pepe the Frog shirt and pushing her baby in a stroller. According to the Times of San Diego, this guy recorded a 14 minute video of himself spouting his views and also recorded the ensuing police interaction. He later uploaded that to a platform that was associated with hate groups. Echoing the sentiments of that conehead, Nazi Mouth said that he was protesting the stay at home, wear a mask rule because the governor of California was a Nazi. Which kind of begs the question that if you're wearing a Nazi flag on your face, why would you be upset about the governor being a Nazi? I mean, what did he think it was like under Hitler? How do you think Nazism works? He also stated that he and his wife were unemployed and had lost their jobs because of the pandemic and that they had nothing left, no quality of life. He was enraged because people were trying to control him and tell him what to do, you know, like saving other people's lives by not spreading disease. He was, st but he was standing up for what was right, he says. And I understand being angry, but I assure you that out of all of the solutions we could possibly come up with to that type of anger, Wearing a swastika on your face is not one of them. I do think he made an interesting point uh, saying it was a peaceful protest, but was it? He wasn't killing anybody or physically attacking anyone and a store employee told him that's a hate crime, but I don't agree with that either. But he was proudly wearing the flag of the regime responsible for the systematic cold-blooded murder of at least six million Jewish people and other undesirables. Grocery stores are privately owned and they can generally make up their own rules. You've seen those signs that say, no shoes, no shirt, no service. And maybe that's just for hygiene, I don't know. But they also say we reserve the right to refuse service to anyone. Were his First Amendment rights violated? Or is wearing a swastika mask the equivalent of shouting fire in a theater? It's not illegal to hate people. And I support their right to hate people. I support the right of anybody to think anything they want, even if they want to destroy cohesion, peace, or society as a whole. And that's the challenge of America, isn't it? To allow this wide range of thoughts, anarchist thoughts, though not allowing the actions that are the logical result of those thoughts. Is denoting a crime as a hate crime an attempt to legislate individual thought? Are we criminalizing the First Amendment? Does it matter why criminals do what they do? Yes. That's where the whole first degree, second degree thing comes in. It's about intent. The intent to commit a crime that was predetermined even if the victim was TBD. What's socially acceptable changes with the times. And Mr. Nazi Mouth made another good point. He told the police that the gay rights rainbow flag was offensive to him, but he never called the cops on it. But if he was arguing that he had a right to go into a privately owned business and express his views without any pushback, then surely he supported the gay couple who sued the privately owned bakery that wouldn't bake a cake for their wedding. Right? And if he's going to compare a swastika to a rainbow flag, then the question is, is a historically repressed group fighting for equality the same as a majority ethnic group actively advocating for the destruction of others? I don't support his views. But in Santee, a town that's 82% white, he knows that he has some support, whether those neighbors will admit it or not. Oh, and then on the 14th of this month, a guy walked into another grocery store in Colorado, also wearing a hood.
I had a friend who lives in Santee, and I really don't know if we're friends anymore because I don't know if I can get past the, what she said. I will say that you should be really careful about Facebook because, oh boy, you really learn people's politics. I was always of the opinion that if I could just explain my views better, then I could have a chance of changing people's minds, but that's not how opinions work. So the harder I pushed, the harder she pushed back, and it escalated very quickly. She was posting about how pussy-grabbing Trump was bringing biblical values back to the White House, and how even legal immigrants weren't really American because they had different traditions and values. I really don't want to get into politics on this channel because that'll drive people away. But when the president says stuff like that, I don't think you can laud them for their moral stance. If a person doesn't see themselves as discriminatory, there's really nothing you can say to them that will change their mind. And I just hope that maybe her views will change over time. And when it comes to a divisive figure like Trump, the problem for me isn't that his supporters are ignorant of his moral failings, but that they don't care. Character matters in our leaders, and I think even they believe that. Talking about politics is always difficult, so to help out the situation, I brought my foster kitten along so he can make us feel better. So anyway, my friend was posting all sorts of scapegoating extremist political views, and I was pushing back, and she was pushing back, and I pointed out that I talked about all this in my video, Taboos and Why They Matter. Go ahead and check out that video because it's really good. And um, she was expressing the societal position as being a heterosexual white woman in her 50s. I told her that kind of skews your view, you know? And I asked her to think about what would it be like if she wasn't a heterosexual white woman in a Republican town? And what if she faced the same amount of pushback and you don't fit in and you have to fit in that she expresses towards others. When fear outweighs critical thinking, we're setting ourselves up to be treated in the same way that we treat other people. Isn't that right, Tampico? Yes, it is. My friend pushed back against these um, opinions and said she's not a racist, and I don't think she is. You know, the current thing she was upset about was a story that some immigrants weren't flying the American flag. And I do understand her feelings about that. The American flag is a symbol of American pride and support of our policies and philosophies and actions in the whole world and how the government treats its people. But if you think about this from a minority person's standpoint, it might be understandable why they don't feel pride in America. And that's problematic. That's they're being told to have the same moral stance as my friend because she says so and it doesn't make someone evil to have disagreements uh, it's the same kerfuffle about uh saying the pledge of allegiance in public schools right schools whose students have families that come from every political and religious background these families pay for those children to be educated in the public school system and schools used to require <laughs> and schools used to require these minor children five days a week to stand up and take a moral oath that they would politically and philosoph philosophically agree with the government and honor it even though they couldn't possibly comprehend government politics so i understand some people are upset about the pledge of allegiance being gone i mean yeah we should totally bring that back makes complete sense to me. Here's a thought. It's just a thought. Maybe we should teach our children the good and the bad American history and let them come to their own conclusion if they're proud of America or not. And I bet a lot of them will be. Go into military service and be inspired and that's that's wonderful. And I and if they're not proud, you're distracting me. And if they're not, can you hear her meowing? Sorry, him. Hi, sweetheart. I know this is depressing, isn't it? But if they're not proud of America, then maybe that will inspire them too, and they'll go out and try to make the changes that they see that they think need to be changed. There are a lot of advantages to being an American and a lot to be really proud of. And <laughs> my friend might change some minds if she shares this with the people that don't think so. The birds at the top of the tree only see the beautiful sky. They don't see all the birds sitting on all the lower branches. And the lower and lower you get, the more poop you got on your head. 
And so it's confusing to me how she can tacitly support views that are adopted and abused by extremists who do take the next logical step into violence or, or, or other forms of severe discrimination. If Mr. President Trump is right and immigrants and inner cities are awful and crime filled and immigrants from shithole countries, his words not mine, are here making America worse, then if you really believe that, then having major pushback is completely reasonable. That would make sense to me. Or at least the feelings that you should do something about it would make a lot more sense. These groups themselves, some of which are here in Santee, they said, oh, they felt emboldened. They were, they were happy to have uh, President Trump and he's their guy. Intentional or not, that's the message that he sent. Why wouldn't you wear a KKK hood to the store? I mean, they don't, they don't need to hide anymore. You know, pride. So since the grocery store incident, there has been a substantial backlash, uh, quite positively, from Santee residents and uh, figures. The mayor put out a statement saying this is unacceptable. And although he is being criticized for not calling out the hate groups specifically, um, besides the mayor's well-meaning address, there's also been articles by local citizens and op-eds talking about um, <laughs> how they view Santee. There's also been a lot of comments in the Santee Facebook group that I'm in. And when I posted about that I was gonna make this video, the very first comment it got is, Santee is not racist. Another person said that I was glorifying these guys and giving them attention and rehashing all these irrelevant issues of racism from the past because, you know, Santee solved racism. Yay, we did it. And then I was reminded, okay, I was being a smart ass, but uh, they don't see it because they're at the top of the tree. A lot of people, including the mayor, they say, these guys don't represent our community, but don't they? At least part of the community? And then I was reminded that the incidents weren't really racist because these guys said they were just protesting the face mask law, right? I mean, and I can understand that. I protest things too. Um, I need to protest, so I'm gonna look for my KKK hood and my swastika flag, right? So, it's a, I know they're around here somewhere. Um, I can't find it. Can I borrow yours? I think it's naive of this community to sweep racist attitudes under the rug as if they don't um, <laughs> as if they don't exist anymore, as if they're irrelevant because that's not going to help our story move forward. And Tam Pico really wants our our story to move forward. The 90% of the responses that I got were from the white community, and I'm not calling them all racist because they're not, and I will fight you on that. I have some white friends. I only wonder if they'd so easily discount all of this if they were regularly the target of these groups. And this week, residents have applauded a giant sign that's in a second story window on a major thoroughfare that says, uh, hate has no home here and that's gotten some local attention. It's been wonderful. There's also a hashtag, if you wanna check it out, called hashtag this is Santee. And the city council has also taken action. According to the San Diego Union Tribune, Mayor John Minto says, it's time to take a deeper look into the city's history of racism and cultural bias to find out why it exists, in what areas most incidents have been most documented and how pervasive it is in the community. Because you know, he's never heard about this new issue before. And even though in November's election's coming up, is it about that? I'm gonna be really charitable and say no, it's not about the election. And that said, it has been a serious issue for so long. I'm just sad that it took this happening to really focus on it. I wish him all Godspeed. And I also know that it's unfair to expect any politician to solve all the issues, you know, right away. It's so easy to blame. I know that he's... I'm being nice, right? People are gonna think I'm being fair, aren't they? I mean, it is disappointing, but I mean, you know.
At least he's doing what he can do. Mayor Minto is looking to expand the Kompok, or the Community Oriented Policing Committee. Currently it has him, City Manager Marlene Best, Recreation Services Manager Ann Morrison, three members of the San Diego County Sheriff's Department, and other community members. Minto suggested adding two people he knew, quote, an African-American pastor from the southeastern part of the city of San Diego, somebody who's dealt with race in all of his life and has talked about how he's going to heal and a woman, that's right, a woman who has been part of the Anti-Defamation League and is a former school principal who is a real solution finder and um, taught acceptance to the students at her schools. But reading this kind of rubbed me the wrong way. All the key players have names. Minto, Best, Morrison, these two new members. They talked for a paragraph about their qualifications and they do sound really qualified. I'm, I'm glad they're coming. But they didn't mention their names. I mean, the fact that they are adding a woman and an African-American is great. And like I said, they sound really qualified and I'm excited for them to come. But why weren't they there before? Right? I mean, is it because racism has been largely ignored in Santee and the 2% of black and other minority groups didn't have any representation before this? As a citizen of Santee, I can say that this has been a wake-up call for all of us. Do we want to improve our current political climate? This really brought all this stuff up. It seems that overall, Santee is getting better. Is Santee perfect? No. But hey, at least we're getting a woman and a black guy.